1982 from University of California, San Diego, and his PhD in 1989 from Stanford University. He is presently the Herbert Taylor Distinguished Professor of Molecular Biology of Florida State University. Among his honors are elected as an American Association of Advancement of Science Fellow in 2008 and elected Council Delegate in 2010. His main research interest is DNA replication and the study of chromosome structure and function. His talk today is titled in Developmental Control of Replication Timing and Chromosome Architecture. Please welcome Dr. Gilbert to the University of Michigan. Thank you. Okay, Thank you, Indika. That was uh, relatively reserved for you. I expected something somehow more animated or longer or something. That's great. So thanks for the invitation. This is actually my first time, my first scientific visit here. My last visit to this campus was uh, as a very early graduate student for the International Student Pugwash Conference, which was held on this campus. And uh, so that was back in my idealistic days, I guess. And I had a philosophy major, and I was still kind of thinking I could keep doing that. And then, of course, life took over. So that was a long time ago. OK, so today I'm going to talk to you about our uh, studies linking uh, the replication timing program that we can now measure very easily genome-wide with a three-dimensional organization of chromatin in the nucleus, which we're only now just beginning to develop uh, nice tools to examine uh, genome-wide. So let's see. Oh, right. I have to do this manually, which is my fault, because my computer won't recognize the thing. Um, so first, a little background. So in eukaryotic cells, and particularly in, in uh, eukaryotes with large genomes, replication proceeds via the synchronous firing of clusters of replication origins which together form what I like to call replication domains. And although uh, we, we all have 10 to 100 times as many potential origins as we need, and each individual molecule, each homologue, and each cell is using a different cohort of replication origins, and they're chosen stochastically, despite this seeming uh, stochastic mechanism, there's a very defined temporal order in which these domains replicate. So you have early replicating domains late replicating domains, and this is an oversimplification. You have the continuum in between middle replicating domains, et cetera. And the reason why um, I'm so interested in this program and have is sort of devoted uh, most of my career, at least as, as of the last 10 years, to this problem is because every eukaryote has a temporal order uh, of replication, and it's highly conserved between closely related species, whereas origin positions are not. And we see that it goes awry in diseases, but we have very little understanding of the mechanism, and we have almost no understanding of its biological significance, which I think for myself is even more important. Uh, there's no a priori reason why you would imagine you would have to duplicate the genome in any particular order simply to duplicate the DNA exactly once per cell cycle. And there's this long-standing correlation between genetic activity, euchromatin, transcriptional activity, and early replication. And we know that chromatin is assembled at the replication fork. And we have some evidence that different types of chromatin are assembled at different times during S phase. So putting that all together makes for a very tempting hypothesis that the replication timing program uh, somehow is there to maintain stable epigenetic state. But we don't have any real solid direct evidence for this. OK, so some years ago, uh, we developed this method to look at replication timing genome-wide, and it's built on uh, from methods that I developed as a graduate student, actually, to look at individual sequences. And uh, as a graduate student, I realized that you could measure replication in any cell type and thereby compare any cell type to any other cell type by simply labeling cells with bromodeoxyuridine and then staining them for DNA content and sorting cells that are in different stages of S phase based on their DNA content. So if you stain cells for DNA content, you're going to get a peak of cells that are unreplicated, G1 phase, and then an increasing DNA content as cells go through S phase, and then another peak as they're going through G2 and M. We can then isolate the DNA and immunoprecipitate the nascent DNA with antibodies to BRDU. And then in the modern day version of this, 
we can take the early and late, the nascent DNA from early and late S phase and either differentially label it or index it and hybridize it or sequence it. And when we do this, um, the raw data looks something like this. Push the right button here. Um, and what you can see is that if we express, this is uh, along the length of a chromosome, 50 megabases. And on the y-axis is replication timing expressed as a log ratio of enrichment in early S versus enrichment in late S. And right away, you can see that there are, in fact, these large megabase size domains that replicate at uh, fairly synchronously, separated or punctuated by what we call temporal transition regions, or TTRs. OK, and so then we can uh, smooth these data and segment them. And then we can ask questions about how many domains are there, where are the boundaries, et cetera. And so to summarize many years of work, uh, what we find is that when we look at differentiating stem cells or compare different cell types, about half of the genome changes this temporal order. So you'll see domains that'll switch from, say, early to late, late to early, et cetera, during the course of differentiation. But the other half of the genome is fairly constant. And these changes, when we see them occur, they occur coordinately across units of 400 to 800 kb. And so while you can see these large multi-megabase domains that replicate at fairly similar times, those are made up of subdomains that you can reveal by differentiating cells and seeing them coordinately changing in their replication timing. So this was our first indication molecularly that we're, there were really units of replication timing regulation. And <clears throat> these changes we found, uh, somewhat as expected, are coordinated with changes in transcription, chromatin, and then as I'll show you, the three-dimensional organization of the genome. And uh, one of the findings we found uh, uh, by looking at lots of different cell types and differentiating them, et cetera, was that uh, late replication is associated with an epigenetically stably repressed state. And by that, what I mean is that the genes that are most difficult to reprogram when you're making uh, iPS cells reside in domains, a set of domains, that shift from early replication in pluripotent cells to late replication in all three germ layers approximately at the time of gastrulation. So in epiblast, you find these to be late. And in all other cell types, you find them to be late. So it's a small set of domains that are early replicating only in pluripotent cells. And those contain the genes that are the most difficult to reprogram. So this is all cor correlative data, of course. But it's the strongest evidence that late replication represents a stable barrier to gene expression. Okay. So uh, this is an example of a fairly recent study. I just got the email about two hours ago that I think it's been accepted now to genome research. Um, there's uh, about 26 cell types here. Most of them are differentiation intermediates from human embryonic stem cells. We have these exquisitely beautiful differentiation systems in collaboration with Steve Dalton at the University of Georgia, who maintains a core facility. And we have a program project grant. And he's developed these beautiful systems where we can get many intermediate stages of a differentiation from a definitive endoderm to liver, definitive endoderm to pancreas. We can go through the mesoderm lineages to smooth muscle and actually onto cardiomyocytes now. We can even make neural crest and go back from the ectoderm back to the mesoderm and make mesenchymal stem cells, et cetera. And so whenever we get a large data set, what we, one of the first things we do is divide, divide the genome into 14,200 kb segments. And then we, um, just do an unsupervised clustering based on replication timing, shown here. More late is in red, more early is in green. And what you can see right away is that um, about a quarter of the genome is replicated early in all these different cell types, and about a quarter is replicated late in all these different cell types. And about half the genome is changing during differentiation. And then we can do a k-means clustering based on these uh, changing regions. And you can see that the cells cluster very nicely based on their lineages. Down here, pluripotent cells, uh, endoderm, uh, mesoderm, crest, you know, crest, if you're interested in that vertebrate-specific tissue, clusters with mesoderm, interestingly. And then blood cells have their own uh, cluster, separate cluster. And we can then identify what we call replication timing signatures, which are sets of domains that replicate at unique times in particular cell types. So now, 
one of the things that people are generally most interested in is transcription. How does this replication timing program relate to uh, transcriptional programs and cell identity? And as I told you, there's this decades-long correlation between transcription and early replication. And if we look at all the genes in all the cell types and pool them all together, you can see there's a very strong correlation such that the vast majority are replicated early when they're expressed. However, what we found in this particular study was that if we break the genes up into the genes that are constitutively replicated, this is constitutive and switching based on replication timing, and those that switch replication, you can see that this correlation is driven by the guys that are kind of not very interesting, the ones that are constitutively replicated. The ones that switch, although there's still a correlation between early replication, which is on the right here in expression, you can see that there are plenty of genes that can express quite strongly even when late replicating. This now really challenges decades of literature. So we broke this up. Uh, we broke these. So here's a, a pie chart of all genes. You can see that most are constitutive. There's still a good chunk of genes that are switching replication timing. And if we break these up into genes that are expressed only when early that we call E class, or genes that are expressed only when late. There's a very tiny number of those genes expressed only when late. Or genes that we originally called control, because we didn't think there would be very many of them. These are genes that can be expressed when late replicating in at least one cell type. And, and then these are genes we have no transcription data on. So that's, those are just thrown out. But what you can see is that these C-class genes can be expressed very strongly even when they're late replicating. And most surprisingly from this data set is that they're the majority of genes. So I could show you a whole bunch of correlations. And after today, maybe I'm learning this audience would have really liked to see all that stuff. But uh, most people fall asleep when you start showing lots of correlations. Um, what I want to just, just tell you and summarize is that both this conundrum, this, this uh, a discordance with the literature, and the solutions of the conundrum were a result of the fact that we had such exquisitely uh, defined differentiation system where we could look at these intermediates. Because what we found was both the C and the E class, their transcription is correlated with replication timing. It's, it's coordinated with. In other words, the, the uh, C class genes are only coming on in the lineages where they're switching from late to early replication. However, the C class genes are coming on. Here what we show is a is a domain that's late replicating and in the periphery of the nucleus. I'll get into the 3D organization later. And what we see is shortly in the lineage just prior to uh, the replication timing switch, you see these C-class genes come on. So they come on when they're still late replicating. And then later you see a switch to early replication, which is coincident with a change in 3D organization. And then the um, E-class here in green come on after the switch. And by corollary, when you see switches from early to late, you see first the, uh, so you have the E-class genes on. Then you see the genes switch to become, you see the E-class genes go off. Then you see the switch to late replication. And the C-class genes are still hanging on even after that switch. So if we didn't have these precise lineages, we wouldn't have found that so many genes are able to be expressed when late. Yeah. Classifying uh, the timing. So we call the timing by the TSS, just for the sake of having a. Well, computationally, that's correct. Yeah. But remember, these domains are half a megabase. So it does become relevant sometimes, but because a lot of genes are found in these transition. So that's why we focused on the promoter, um, because we don't really know exactly where all the enhancers are. Maybe we will know that soon with Chia Pet and things like that. But, um, so yeah, that's, that's something to take into account when interpreting the data. And none of the reviewers raised that point. But I think, um, I think it's the best we can do right now for defining when the when the guts of the gene, when the regulatory elements of the gene replicate. 
go by the by the promoter and I mean how far away are enhancers on average 50 kb that would still be close in a, by our standards okay so moving on to another long standing question has been why has it been so difficult to identify transacting factors that regulate replication timing the short answer to this is that we find it's an incredibly robust property of chromatin and so uh, historically though the yeast people the budding yeast people in particular have identified some uh, proteins with generally chromatin regulators uh, mutations in which will affect the replication timing of some origins in each organism where you can actually talk about origins budding yeast and it, but usually these effects are subtle and affect only a small portion of the genome and more importantly when we go and we look at those gene products in mammalian cells, the homologs of those chromatin regulators, they have no effect on replication timing. And even in some cases where you see, for example, H3K9 dimethylation, highly, highly correlated with late replication. You knock out G9A, the enzyme that dimethylates, you wipe out detectable methylation, dimethylation, and you have no effect on replication timing. And so that's a very powerful result for a graduate student or a postdoc because it's very difficult to get them to do any more experiments like that. But we do, we have done maybe somewhere between a dozen and 20 different knockouts. And it's very, it, it, it is the case that every time, with this one exception, we have almost no effect at all on replication timing. So um, I was at a meeting in 2011 where uh, Sarah Bonomo, who was at the EMBL in Rome, she's now in Edinburgh, was giving a talk, and she showed she was studying this protein that regulates telomere length in yeast. She was in Titia Delange's lab, and she was studying it in mammalian cells. Found that it had no effect on telomere length in mammalian cells, but it had weird effects on chromatin, and it looked it just smelled to me like it might uh, affect replication timing. So we got the cells from her, and we um, analyzed them, and what you can see is we got our first and still only gene product uh, that, that seems to be necessary for the global timing program. So here's the replication timing program of wild type mouse embryonic stem cells. These are conditional knockouts, so it's kind of an acute loss of the gene product. And in red is um, what happens when you lose RIF1. You can see that there's sort of a, uh, a really craziness to the replication timing program. And we don't actually yet understand why it is so heterogeneous, why it's so noisy appearing at least. Um, but we have early to late switches and we have late to early switches throughout the genome. And then just uh, recently it's unpublished, uh, we have chip data now which show that RIF1 basically paints the late replicating domains and is depleted from the early replicating domain. And talk about broad peak calls, I mean this is a very broad peak call if you try to go in and call peaks. Um, you know, the typical algorithms aren't going to find these. It's a very, uh, you know, broad, spread out kind of a protein. Um, so that's all we know currently in mammalian cells. <clears throat> but as usual, uh, in mammalian, particularly in DNA replication, we look to the yeast people to tell us what's going on. So what do we think rif ones doing? Well, first let me give you a very quick crash course in how replication is regulated in eukaryotic cells. So what happens is, as soon as the cells exit mitosis, the anaphase promoting complex is activated, it's ubiquitin ligase, it destroys cyclins, it destroys geminin, and so you have this huge switch, and under those conditions, low cyclin-dependent kinase activity, um, the, the various proteins, the origin recognition complex, et cetera, uh, collaborate to load the helicase, which is a heterohexameric uh, complex of mini chromosome maintenance proteins. And these are loaded very stably around double-stranded DNA. So that's an inactive helicase loaded in a very stable state around double-stranded DNA. And then the cells wait until the conditions become appropriate to enter S phase. And when that happens, cyclin-dependent kinase activities rise. And you also have the activation of another kinase called CDC7. CDC7's job is to phosphorylate MCMs, which allows the recruitment of an protein called CDC45 that basically then leads to the unwinding of the DNA and then the helicase has to be opened 
the DNA open, and then the helicase goes around a single strand of DNA and then is able to unwind. Okay? So that's uh, DNA replication in a nutshell. And about the same year, in the, exactly the same year, where we uh, looked at RIF1 for simply nothing more than instinct guesses, um, a friend of mine, Hisao Masai in Tokyo, did a much smarter experiment, which was to uh, look for genes in yeast that could complement the loss or the lack of CDC7 kinase. And he came out with the same gene in fish and yeast, RIF1. And he showed that knockout of RIF1 in uh, fish and yeast caused a disruption of replication timing. Now, RIF1 in budding yeast was known as a telomere regulator, and it always been, had been studied as a telomere regulator. It stands for RAP1 interacting factor. So the yeast people had never looked anywhere else. And when these data came out, they very quickly went to look, did we miss something? Uh, is RIF1 affecting replication timing throughout the genome? And in these four papers came out last year altogether, showing the same thing, which not only is RIF1 uh, affecting replication, uh, involved in replication timing in budding yeast, but they gave us a mechanism, which was really nice. So as it turns out, um, RIF1 has a domain on it that uh, attracts a protein called protein phosphatase 1. Protein phosphatase 1 dephosphorylates the same residues that CDC7 phosphorylates. So basically what RIF1 is doing, wherever it binds, it's not known where it binds in budding yeast. In fishing yeast, it binds several KB from origin. Uh, but wherever it binds, it's going to attract the phosphatase, which is going to antagonize the kinase, which is going to delay initiation replication. So it, and, and so if you delete RIF1 or you delete the sequences that RIF1 binds to in yeast, then you're going to get an origin that fires earlier. So we now know that looking back, mammalian RIF1 does have a protein phosphatase 1 binding domain. So of course, now we're very interested in looking into that mechanism and potentially being able to manipulate replication timing in embryonic stem cell differentiation context. Okay? So that's, whoops, that's another story. Uh, okay, so then two more chapters here. Then in the next uh, bit, I'm going to talk about the three-dimensional organization of chromatins. So as it turns out, the DNA that's replicated at different times during S phase is located in different compartments of the nucleus. And we can see that <clears throat> by pulse labeling cells in nucleotide analog and then using fluorescent antibodies against those analog, analog to localize where DNA synthesis takes place. And if we do very short, very brief pulse labels between 10 and 30 minutes, what you see is that replication takes place in these punctate foci within the nucleus that are appropriately called replication foci. And if you label early in S phase in green here, you label the interior of the nucleus, excluding the periphery and the nucleoli, the nucleolar periphery. And if you label late, you label the periphery and the nucleoli. And so what's interesting about these individual foci, in addition to their three-dimensional pattern, is that if you label cells and then you chase them for multiple generations, you, what, you, you have fewer and fewer chromosomes labeled multiple generations, but the foci themselves, they don't mix or separate, and most importantly, they don't diminish in intensity, which means that the DNA that's synthesized together in space remains together as a structural unit of chromosome from cell cycle to cell cycle. And these are some of the papers that first showed this, and I've quoted some of the quotes from the titles of these papers, structurally stable complexes, etc., because these are the people who got really upset when everybody got on the TAD bandwagon, because they've been saying there are 500 kilobase structures that are stable, and there are two compartments of the nucleus. Okay, For decades, this has been known. But importantly, the molecular maps weren't known. So we got into this game, too, but we were interested in how this 3D organization might relate to the cell cycle regulation of replication, which was, well, all came out in the 90s. And so what we had done was uh, uh, we pulse labeled cells uh, differentially with different analogs that we can distinguish with different antibodies, as you probably surmised from the previous slide. And so we label early or late, but then we chase cells through to the next mitosis, where you can see bands on chromosome, and then into the following G1. And then the first question was, how long does it take for this, these bands to find their interface positions? And what we find is that in early G1, 
at a distinct stage after the nuclear envelope has formed, so there's truly a nucleus there, the chromatin is more or less randomly organized. And if we used fluorescent nucleotides and introduced those into cells and looked at uh, these in living cells, you would see that these foci were very, very dynamic, moving all around. And then at a particular time, about two hours after nuclear envelope formation, these uh, domains would find their interphase positions where they would then remain for the rest of interphase. Okay? And there's been studies to show how stable these are. They're basically moving uh, only a half a micron, which seems to be almost Brownian motion. So they, they seem to be fixed once they're fixed. We could then take these nuclei, nuclei from these cells in these different stages of early G1 phase and introduce them into a Xenophis egg extract, which would then jumpstart S phase within nuclei isolated at any time during G1. And we could then ask the, about the preparedness of the chromatin for the replication program. And what we found was that nuclei isolated very early in S phase, uh, it, when we jumpstarted replication, replication took place in a random temporal order. And then at a time that we called the timing decision point, the nuclei experienced a transition such that now the same extracts would execute the replication program in the proper temporal order. And this time point was coincident within an hour of the formation of the three-dimensional organization of the chromatin. Okay? So this is quite a while ago now. So we proposed this rather crude model that whatever it is that determines replication timing, those determinants perhaps are dispersed during mitosis. And then as chromatin becomes anchored, once it becomes anchored, there is then the possibility of seeding the assembly of different subcompartments of different molecular composition. And then just quite simply that perhaps those different compartments of the nucleus could set thresholds for replication, thereby um, determining the replication timing. Okay, but this, so as, a, as of about 2009, we knew that we had stable units of replication. We could see them cytogenetically, and we could see them as 400 to 800 KB coordinate units of developmental regulation of replication timing. We knew that they changed coordinately with chromatin structure and were coordinated with, with transcription, but we didn't have a molecular handle on their structure so that we could go in and, you know, and do manipulative experiments until uh, December of 2009. And from today's discussions, I think I can go very quickly through this. It seems like everybody here is studying high to something. And so basically, uh, we call this our Christmas present. This came out in the December issue of Science. Um, uh, this is high C method. If there's anybody in here who doesn't know how that works, you fix populations of cells, cross-link everything to everything. Uh, bash up the chromatin, cut with the restriction enzyme, re-ligate, and then sequence across the junction so that you get a list of all the restriction sites that were in close proximity, spatial proximity with all the other restriction sites uh, in the genome. And when these data were first published, uh, one of the ways that Yobes group displayed these data was as an eigenvector, which most people in this room understand much better than I do. I think it just as a low resolution megabase scale view of chromatin interaction. And what they concluded was that the interactions are divided into two groups. They're called A and B group. And uh, A sequences in the A group can interact with other sequences in the A group along the length of the chromosome, even at long distances. Of course, these are normalized for distance. But they are uh, prevented or depleted from interaction, interacting with chromatin in the alternate compartment even though those domains might be right next to them. But importantly, when we saw these data, I remember an email from my graduate student about 2 in the morning. These look an awful lot like replication timing profile. And they certainly did, but <clears throat> we uh, wanted to look at these in the same cell line that Yo had looked at IC in. So we quickly profiled that cell line, which we can do. And the correlation was really uncanny. And if you overlay these, what you see is that the subtle variations in replication timing match subtle variations in the interaction frequencies along the length of the chromosome. And this is the highest correlation for any chromosomal property, even higher, uh, well, similar to RIF1, I guess I should say. But when um, the higher resolution, I guess we haven't redone this with the, the newest 
you know, data, but the higher resolution stuff came out and our correlations got even higher. So um, this is an uncanny correlation and it leads immediately to the hypothesis that perhaps uh, these little subtle variations are the replication domains that we know are the units of regulation. And, you know, these regions are regions that are, that are replicating in a similar time. And I think Yobe's group was thinking along similar lines because in their model picture they proposed that there are these self-interacting units. They called them at the time fractal globules. You guys probably all remember that. And then the physicists screamed because that had so much uh, implication to it. To, to fractal globule had so much implication to it. So they're now called more descriptively topologically associated or associating domains or TADs, which is what I'll call them from now on. And TADs, so the chromatin between two TADs can interact when they're in the same compartment. Most of the interactions are within the TAD, but the TADs are depleted from interaction with TADs in the alternate compartment even when they're right next door. And I just show this old cartoon to show you how much, how this, what an epiphany this must have been for us is this is how we were thinking about replication uh, domains in the lab. So this immediately raised the hypothesis that replication domains are actually TADs. And this, by the way, was the first thing that convinced me that 3C people are actually looking at something real <clears throat> once you see your own data and someone else's data. And then that the replication timing is reflecting the compartment, which is a result of inter-TAD interaction. So we set out to test this hypothesis. Um, okay, so what we, we chose to test this hypothesis was 4C rather than high C for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is particularly when we started these experiments, as you'll see, we, or we started these in, in 2012, uh, 4C was much higher resolution than high C. I think it still is, but um, of course, you, if you add Broad, maybe you can get that kind of depth. But at any rate, 4C is very, um, by, what, what you do is you look at the interactions of one site with all the other sites throughout the genome, and by focusing all your information on interactions with one site, you can get much higher resolution. But you can also position these baits, so to speak, in different informative locations, early domains, late domains, uh, developmentally regulated domains, et cetera. Okay. So there are several predictions from this hypothesis. First, and you're going to see, by the way, just for your information, we're going to go from 4C chip to 4C seek. So you're going to see an increase in resolution there in these two slides. So the first uh, hypothesis we wanted to test is that if this is correct, then the TADs should retain their boundaries during differentiation, but the inter-TAD interactions should change as in change compartment. So what you see here on the left is mouse embryonic stem cells being differentiated to neural precursor cells. The blue is the replication timing program, and this shaded uh, uh, vertical line is the position of the bait. So you can see we position the bait in a domain here that switches from early to late replication during differentiation. And uh, when we do the 4C chip, you can see that the uh, interaction frequencies drop off uh, at, at approximately the same location, both in the ESCs and the NPCs. But the inter-TAD interactions switch from being primarily with early domains to being primarily with late domains as the domain switches from early to late. And if we then plot the replication timing of the interaction partners with this bait and other baits that we tested, you can see that there's a pretty demonstrable shift from being primarily with early replicating regions to being primarily with late replicating regions. So we call this a compartment switch. That This is how we speak about this uh, as occurring during differentiation. Now, the other, uh, another prediction of our hypothesis is that since replication timing is established at the timing decision point, at that point a couple of hours after mitosis, we would predict that the inter-TAD interactions, if that's what's dictating timing, should be formed just at that point during mitosis. And while we were carrying these experiments out, Yo Decker published his, um, I think it was in Science, anyway, his study of metaphase chromosomes showing that all of this TAD structure and inter-TAD interaction is lost during mitosis, at least the detectability of that. 
So it had to be gained at some point. And <clears throat> so this slide looks rather busy, but it's, it's going to become simple, I promise. So in blue here, again, is the replication timing. And we're looking in a single cell line now where we have done many years of DNA replication studies. And we know when the timing decision point is precisely in the cell line. And it's a very nice cell line to synchronize. OK, so in blue is the replication timing. So that's going to be the same in all four of these plots. And the top pair is a late bait. And the bottom pair is an early bait. OK? And what you're looking at are its interactors in the pre-TDP and post-TDP stages of early G1 phase. Okay? So now you should be able to see that whether you're a late bait or an early bait, in the pre-TDP stages, I'm sorry, the hits, the interactors, are labeled green for early regions and red for late regions. So you should be able to see that in the pre-TDP stages, whether you're an early, a late or an early bait, you interact more or less randomly with early and late sequences throughout the chromosome. But at this point, just an hour or so later, you see that the, the late bait interacts almost exclusively with late regions of the chromosome and the early bait almost, almost exclusively with early regions. And if we quantify that now in gray is the replication timing of all the restriction sites uh, along the length of chromosome 8, you can see in the pre-TDP stages, both early and late bait interact with the entire chromosome, whereas the post-TDP stages, now you see that difference between 4C chip and 4C peak. They're almost exclusively late with late and early with early. And then we could then do a time course. This, by the way, has been accepted to genome research, so that should, we hope, this all be out soon. Um, so you can see that if we do a time course during early G1 phase, you can see that the, the completion of this interacting pattern happens coincident with the time and decision point. Okay? So we call this uh, a, the establishment of the compartment, uh, which is going to be happening after each uh, mitosis. OK, so up until now, I've shown you lots of uh, genomics, which is correlation. There's no causality in genomics, despite what some papers claim. <clears throat> and uh, but so, so the question is, these tabs and their boundaries and their equivalence to replication domain, is that functionally important? Okay, that, do those, does the structure of the tabs really matter to the cell? And we think so. I'm going to show you a couple of lines of evidence in the next few slides. First of all, um, when we see cases of translocation, for example, in cancer cell lines, what we find was when in early domain is juxtaposed next to a late replicating domain, what happens is the early replicating property slimes into the late replicating domain. And we know this must be due to the activation of origin because we have relatively synchronous replication across a fairly large region, tens to hundreds of kilobases. And that early replication property uh, proceeds for some distance until a new temporal transition region is created. And the evidence that this that the boundaries of replication domains are important is that where this new temporal transition forms is always at the position of a temporal transition region in some other cell type. So the cell is recognizing that this, in another cell type, this would be a temporal transition region. So this has meaning to the cell. And it's as if these replication domain boundaries are confining the influence of this translocation to the TAD, okay, to the TAD that was translocated. Now, if we look, these are cartoons summarizing a lot of data, of course, and it's published. Um, if we look expressly at a chromosome that has a lot of rearrangements and that has been deeply sequenced to know where all the junctions are, we can then ask the question, what is sufficient when DNA is plunked in an ectopic site? What is sufficient to transfer the replication timing property? And when we did this type of experiment, we found that uh, if a segment lacks its timing transition region, it replicates at the time of the ectopic insert into which it goes. But if it retains that timing transition region in its ectopic site, it retains its replication timing. So that's additional evidence that there's something important about 
the structure of these pads that um, retains information about its function. Now, what you really want to see is some deletion and transplantation studies, and those are underway. Not easy, however, in the last year and a half, uh, we've discovered CRISPRs, and now we're going absolutely bonkers. We have tons of deletions, inversions, everything, and, but we just don't have all the data analyzed. But several years ago, when we were going after this, um, making deletions was a huge amount of work. And so uh, we wanted to know where should we make a deletion. The temporal transition regions are quite large. They can be as large as the replication domains themselves. So where would the information be that determines the border of the replication domain? And so um, what we wanted to do, we did start deletions, but they were really complicated, but what we wanted to do is see if we could use computation to narrow down um, the functional, the putatively functional regions. So what we did was we joined ENCODE. I don't know if, if many of you may know. You can join ENCODE. You don't get any money, uh, but you can become an affiliate member for a three-page proposal. Uh, and I felt that this was a good idea at the time because I thought it would expose my people to a lot of computational biologists and a lot of data. And I think it was a good idea a lot of phone calls and stuff, but I also made a lot of contacts. So we joined ENCODE, and, um, and as a result of that, we, uh, you know, we started doing a lot of uh, comparison. So what, what you see here is uh, taking a cell line and collapsing all the timing transition regions into one plot, okay? And then aligning them all at the earliest end of the timing transition. This is a bit of an anachronism. I'm going to tell you why we think it's there in a minute. And then we align that to over 200 chromatin features, transcription factors, you know, all the, all the ENCODE stuff. And what we found is the vast majority, when there was a correlation at all, it correlated more or less with replication timing. In other words, um, there were several marks that correlate with early replication. Interestingly, none correlate with late replication. We can have some questions about that later in the slide. But the things that we found to correlate with early replication were marks of transcriptional potential, more so than transcriptional activity per se. So more so than a PAL2 chip or a H3K36 methylation, for example. T300, H2K4, ME1, H3K27, acetylation, so enhancer model. But they correlated with the early replication itself, not with the boundary. And, in, and um, another thing we found was that um, when we use these machine learning algorithms, and ask them to, to sort of catalog the genome, but at the megabase scale, most people work at a smaller scale, at the megabase scale, they would very quickly find two states. And those states would be divided as either early or timing transition region plus late. Okay? So there was no distinction in chromatin at the late border of the timing transition region, as if all this represents is the passive fusion of replication forks with forks that are generated from wherever the late domain is that's next door. And that there's not any structural information in that side. And causal. What do you mean by causal? The location of this? Um, just that we couldn't find anything that, that It's, yeah, we would interpret this as being in the domain. This is peaking inside the domain and correlating with early replication. And we, have an, we had another study where we correlated changes to changes. If you look across all the ENCODE cell types, what changes most? And these are the same things that track the best. Okay, so what did coincide with the boundary? We only found two properties. Uh, of chromatin, and neither one was actually an ENCODE property, but at any rate. One was, as you probably guessed, the domain, the boundaries of pads. So for those of you who might not be familiar with how sometimes this data is expressed, um, you, can, you can express this data as a directionality of the majority of interactions. And as you go along the length of the chromosome, 
you'll see these periodic transitions where most of the interactions are occurring upstream, and then you'll pass what's what is called the TAD boundary, and most of the interactions will be going down. So that's how a TAD boundary is defined as the switch between directionality of the interaction. Okay? And if you align those sites, they align almost precisely with the early side of the timing transition region. I heard a noise, no? Okay. And the other one was the boundaries of lamb and associated domains. So domains of chromatin that associate with the nuclear periphery as measured by its interaction with the nuclear lamina, which turns out to be not the thing we're actually tethered to. But at any rate, um, what you can see is that these are also strongly, the boundaries of LADs are strongly uh, associated with the boundaries of these timing transition regions. And so this seems like such a simple result, although I think that's probably why it was published in this journal, because it's simple so they could understand it. But anyway, uh, the, uh, the, the reason this was, it was missed in the literature was because if you look just in one cell type, you won't see much of an alignment. And so it was kind of brushed aside that replication is not really the TAD structure. You get maybe 30% of TAD boundaries aligning with replication timing lines. But this is very logical, actually, because it, very frequently you have several TADs in a row that are replicating at the same time. So by replication timing, you don't find a boundary. Okay, but if you collapse 25 different cell types and, and collapse those all together, suddenly your alignment goes way up to over 80%. And then you can show that the ones that aren't aligning, aligning are replicating at the same time. And so for the for, you know, oversimplification uh, purposes, TADs or RDs, but also LADs are late replicating TADs plus the timing transition. Okay, so that leads us to uh, what we call the replication domain model, which is essentially that replication domains are equal to TADs. These are stable structures with boundaries preserved in different cell types. I just got hell for this from uh, Victor Corsas because he has evidence that the boundaries can be regulated. So, uh, it, but certainly from cell cycle to cell cycle, they're pretty rock solid. And uh, uh, replication timing then, uh, so then this chromatin is organized in a, such a way that the TADs that are in close proximity replicate at similar times. Okay? And then that arrangement is established in early G1 phase. Okay? So now, of course, well, I guess I'll get to that slide later. So in the last little chapter here, um, it stands to reason that um, now that we've shown over the years that there is, that, that replication is regulated during development, that there's a lot of dynamics going on, and that the replication timing profile is characteristic of any cell type. And if you look from individual to individual, it's pretty rock solid. And it was just a paper really stretching the limits and finding clusters of SNPs that correlate with very small changes in replication timing between individuals. But there are also a lot of clusters of SNPs that don't, and a lot of small changes that don't have SNPs. So we don't really understand what that means, but the program is pretty indicative of a cell type. We could call a cell type based on a program. So it stands to reason that different cancers, potentially different cancer clones, would have different replication timing signatures. So we wanted to get into um, cancer some years ago. And um, actually, I was giving a talk at OHSU. And I had my individual visit with Brian Drucker. And he was just going crazy. You have to do B cell acute lymphocytic leukemia. He gave me all these reasons why to do that. Uh, and they're all good reasons to get, get homogeneous uh, preparations. Um, they have these well-characterized cytogenetic subtypes that are already linked to prognosis. There's a large numbers of bank frozen viable samples, COG, St. Jude, et cetera. And they have a very small spectrum of genetic lesions versus most other types of, of tumors. So they estimated less than 10 mutations per uh, cancer. And that coupled with the fact that you have some pretty good idea of where the, the leukemia derives from, these two things will help, uh, would help to interpret any data that we would get. And then finally, they're readily expanded in genograph mice so that you could 
do manipulations of the cancer or manipulations of normal cells and be able to look at the outcome. So, but the biggest thing he said was, at the end of that discussion was, and I will give you the sample. So, of course, that's the biggest thing uh, in, that we've discovered in human cancer biology is getting the sample. Okay, so this just shows you um, a slide just like that early slide of all the embryonic stem cell differentiation intermediates. Except here, what we're doing is clustering uh, a bunch of patient bone marrow samples uh, uh, leukemia. Okay, and so the way I've organized this is you've got the non-leukemic, I don't want to say normal because some of these are cell line, non-leukemic uh, B cell, uh, like these are the B cells, uh, these are lymphoid cells, T lymphocytes, B cells, and myeloid cells. Okay, and then I have two uh, non uh, B ALL type leukemias as comparators, uh, and acute myeloid leukemia and acute TALL. Okay, and then the rest of these guys. I think I have a build here so I'm gonna help describe this. And the rest of these guys are the patient samples, and so they're color coded by genetic subtype. So they have the ETD lungs one translocations in brown here, and the BCR ABLES in purple, and the E2A PBX ones in red. And then the pink ones are ones that have no identifiable subtypes. And right now we're in a collaboration with Children's Oncology Group to look at a cohort of 60 patients that have no identifiable subtypes. 30 live, 30 died, and they won't tell us which, but we're going to tell them um, with our replication timing profile, hopefully. And so what I want you to point out, though, is that uh, this particular genetic subtype, E2A PBX1, has a signature. And now this is actually an old slide, uh, you know, we just keep keep redoing these when we get more samples, but if a sample has E2A PBX1, it falls into this cluster. So we're now engaged in some experiments to knock down E2A PBX1 and leukemia cells, overexpress it in normal cells, and see if there's any true causal relationship between this fusion protein and these patterns of replication. And, um, but you can also see that the other genetic subtype, sorry, this, this is a novel signature that comes up from some of these unidentified guys. You can also see that the other genetic subtypes substratify by replication timing. So replication timing is picking something out that is not conserved amongst this genetic subtype. Okay. So once we have these groups of, of patient samples, we can, or groups of any samples, we can then do a supervised comparison. And this is a former graduate student of mine, developed a program he calls RepliPrint which takes any group of data sets, compares it to any other group of data sets, and finds the statistically most significant um, regions of change. I think they're 200 KB segments. And um, so what you can do, what you can see is you can come out with regions that replicate differently only in TALLs. Gray is just everything else. Uh, only in BALLs. And we actually found these interesting signatures of all leukemias, including AML and TALL. And it, I think this particular one is the LUNX1 gene, which would resonate with anybody who knows hematopoiesis. Um, and then, of course, we could also find patient-specific elements. So these are the ones that we're hoping will link to prognosis because that would be nice for my laboratory. It would also be nice for my, you know, career. You know, Tom, you talked about trying to do something good for society, and so I think I'm entering the second half of my career now. So you kind of feel like you should give something back. So we're hoping that these. And we can translate these very quickly into single cell assays by fish, because when something duplicates, there's two spots. And when something hasn't duplicated, there's one spot. So we can, we've already actually created the kit. We just need the prognosis link. Um, because replication timing measures copy number, we can quickly see uh, deletions or amplifications anyway as either losses or gains in both the early and the late compartments. And we can see translocations as these very abrupt changes in replication timing that can't possibly happen in nature. And uh, what I want to point out from this slide is that the vast majority, though, don't have any of these kind of lesions. And if you look into TCGA, you don't see any clusters and mutations in these regions that are changing in leukemia. So we're proposing that these are epigenetic or developmental control gone awry. And, um, we have additional evidence for that, which is that when we look at these, the red is the patient, or the black is the so-called non-leukemics, and then the gray is, is other cell types. We find that when you find these fingerprints of leukemia, uh, 
they match the pattern of other normal cell types as if uh, what distinguishes normal cell types from each other is distinguishing the cancers from each other. So we think these are, nor these are abnormal developmental control. And so one of the things we'd like to do is get deeply into the hematopoietic system and see where they come from. Where, <coughs> where are these leukemias getting these uh, aberrant replication pattern proteins? Okay. So Indika is getting anxious, so we're on the summary slide. Tads are the units of replication. Although I thought this was Michigan time when it feels like I was in Italy here with nobody was here on the yeah. So anyway, um, tads are the units of replication. Um, replication predicts chromatin comp composition and 3D organization, and this stability can be exploited to predict cell type and potentially cancer. And um, if you're interested in where we're going, uh, we of course are interested in cis-acting features. This is the CRISPR craze. We're going wild with that. Um, uh, order and interdependency of events. These, these human embryonic stem cell systems are so gorgeous. We have full population-wide switches in replication timing within one cell cycle. So now we can stimulate, we, should, we can show that cells differentiate out of G1, out of, out of it, you know, they, they won't respond in S phase. And then, you know, what comes first? The transcription, the replication timing switch, the compartment switch, and the chromatin structure changes, the modification. So we can do this now, finally. Role of RIF1, obvious, and cancer, obvious. And then, uh, oh, if you're interested in these data, we have a database. Um, we have, I don't know how outdated this is, but we put all our data here. It doesn't go public until it's published. Uh, and you can see all the public stuff without a registration. But if you want to see more, you can register. You can request data that's not published. Or you can email me, whatever. But you can upload, download. The beauty of this is the ease of visualization and figure making for us. It's easier than the genome browser. But you can jump. We have a button. You can jump right to the genome browser from there. Here's my group. My lab manager does all the lab management and generates most of the genome-wide data on the side. Uh, Quentin's a computer scientist who kind of gets the data ready. For Juan Carlos, who's a postdoc, who then writes the papers. That's for the sort of genome-wide leukemia and the human embryonic stem cell. Ben just went off to his postdoc at Harvard. He did the TAD alignment, and he did the, um, the rearranged chromosome work. Vishnu is in his third or fourth year. He's a 4C guy. He's actually now developing single cell replicates. He's very, very talented with that. Both these two guys are going to make it. Anyway, that's my lab. So, oh, wait, I guess, sorry. Unpopulated beaches, northern Florida. It's called the Forgotten Coast for a reason. So, forget it. I even told you that. And uh, collaborators and money, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, I can. I once rode my bike 11 miles. I saw, saw three people that I knew. <laughs> so, um, yeah, are there it, data about germ cells? Germ cells, we have not looked at germ cells at all. Sorry, um, but uh, a lot of those kind of things come out of discussions like this. You got some cells. You can easily manipulate them. We can give you a protocol, and we can maybe fit you into the pipeline. Um, but we haven't used germ cells. The germline germ cell mutation rate. Okay. Yeah. 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 We did just do a study of of Centarian as well as progeria, and then oncogene induced senescence. No change. I mean, I don't want to say no. You can use blood from the turnip if you want to. There's some reasons, but almost no change in what's the turnip. Very robust property of cells. Yeah. Tom. So there's a lot of questions to discuss, but just to find me the one. Uh, so you clearly establish boundaries by your method, but the question of what determines the early side and the late side is still a little open, although RIF1 sounds certainly an interesting candidate. Yeah. It does push this question sort of one step back. What targets RIF1? Okay. What controls the distribution? Yeah. yeah. So short answer is no idea. In fishing, so in budding is no idea too. And that's because presume, uh, the, the scuttlebutt is they haven't been able to chip RIF1 anywhere but telomeres. But they think that's because there's so much RIF1 in telomeres that it's not seeing it anywhere else. In fishing yeast, there are sequences. So there are actual DNA sequences. That it targets to. 
and it's been shown to have affinity for um, cruciform DNA, G4 quadruplex. I mean, you know, that, that's that's um, been shown. That's in vitro work. Um, so, I mean, I would, if I had to guess, I would say it's targeted probably by complex mechanisms that target most other proteins, right? Combinations of other interactors and things. But in fish and yeast, there are actually the that LCS, I probably didn't explain it well, but it's a late control sequence that was identified, uh, you know, just by repetition timing studies a long time ago by Joel Huberman. And it was now found that it interacts with, with that RIF1 binds there. In mammals, I mean, we're hoping. So I have a graduate student whose thesis is to, to do that. Sarah Bonomo studying that, and Sarah Masai studying it. I think too many people are studying it. Study RIF1 now. So. But there's going to be more than RIF1 because there's plenty of regions that don't respond when you knock out RIF1. And the more differentiated the cells are, the less uh, effect it has on the genome. So you, if you look at mass, it's only 20 or 30 percent of the genome that's affected. So there's got to be some other things. I'm sure there's plenty of things. I didn't answer your question, did I? <laughs> Give me 20 years. Any other question? Do you know what target the polyphone is? <laughs> 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 uh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.